Jamaica, 1980. A nation is tearing itself apart over the politics of money. In every struggle for democracy we have looked at, there has been a struggle over money, whether here in these blood-soaked streets or anywhere else in the world. Now, let me give you a, an example of Ghana. Uh, Dr. Buzia, the Prime Minister of Ghana, came to me in 1972 and said, we've got a general election coming off. If you can give me sufficient money in some form or other to put clean water into each village in Ghana, I can win this election. I couldn't persuade the Treasury in this country to provide the funds which he needed. He went back. There wasn't even an election. He went back empty-handed and there was a coup. That was the end of democracy in Ghana. When political democracy first showed up in the world, here in Greece, the ancient Athenians were the proprietors of a tremendously wealthy empire. And you have to ask, what's the connection between wealth and democracy? Can you have one without the other? It's quite obvious from the Greek experience alone that in, in states which are very poor, in which people are constantly hungry and having trouble getting enough food supply and so on, that it's very difficult to maintain any kind of democratic system. And I think we have enough examples in our own world, though the situation is much more complicated, that indicate that if you have mass poverty and mass hunger, then you have at least the threat of anti-democratic moves of one kind or another. Here's some interesting reading. Two comparative lists. One from the World Bank, ranking countries according to prosperity. Another from an outfit called Freedom House, ranking countries according to democracy. Of the 30-odd poor countries on this list, only two show up on the democracy list. Of the 24 rich countries on this list, 18 show up on the democracy list. India is one of those poor countries. This man is venerated as a holy man. Swami Agnivash. One day, I walked with him through a quarry near New Delhi to find slavery in the heart of the world's largest democracy. This is one of the fits. Only four or five years ago, it would not have been possible for me to walk in here like that. What would have happened? I would have been assaulted by the goons and muscle men. And at that time, I was a legislator in the state of Haryana. And previous to that, I was minister for education in the state. And yet, my own chief minister threatened me that if you step in any of these stone quarries or brick kilns, you will be beaten to death. That was a threat he held out against me. And you were one of his ministers. Yeah. Earlier, I had resigned because... He had ordered police firing on a crowd of about 10,000 workers, killing about 12 of them. So in mark of protest, I resigned from his cabinet. Ever since I've been working with these quarry workers. In violation of their country's constitution, they must pay the quarry owners for their tools and for services such as dynamite and protection from the owner's goons. All they will have left out of their wages is about 10 rupees, a dollar a day. So the owners lend them money to live on and then use that debt to imprison them here and their children all their lives. His name is Heru. 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 From early childhood, he has been working in these quarries here. Now it is more than 25 years that he has been working as a laborer. Then they borrow some money 
हजार बारह सौ रुपया लिया गया बेहतरीन और बेहतरीन जॉब साढ़े सात सौ अर्लियर द टोटल डेट वॉज अबाउट ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड रुपीज नाउ ही हैज बीन एबल टू रिपे ए पार्ट ऑफ इट नाउ सेवन हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी रुपीज स्टिल रिमेन एज डेट डज ही बिलीव ही एवर पे अर तुम्हें उम्मीद है कि तुम कमा करके ये सारा कर्जा दे दोगे वापस कमाने की तो सुना मुझे कमाऊंगा तो क्या तो इट इज दैट वी आर फॉलोइंग टू द ट्रैप ऑफ डेट फाउंडेज सो वी आर मोर और लेस फाउंडेड फॉर वो लाइफ एंड आवर चिल्ड्रन हैव गॉट नो बेटर फ्यूचर ऑल दीज आर अनसेफ माइंड यू कैन सी द ओवर हैंगिंग इफ ए वर्कर इज वर्किंग डाउन बिलो देयर एनी टाइम द रॉक्स कैन फॉल ऑन हिम इज बी क्रस टू डेथ नमस्ते नमस्ते पीने का पानी It means drinking water. Yes. Huh? So they put up the board, and huh? And they put up the board. They take pictures and produce it in the court. As I am. Yes, we are provided for water centers. Let's find out what's This really in it. This is what you have. It's <laughs> all <laughs> thinking with all. They dropped the stone in there and you couldn't hear it there's no water in there. Mm. Namaste. Thank you. On top of that the Supreme Court judgment says since this law is was being violated all these years now we want that within 6 weeks we want to see that water will is provided. And yet Three years have passed and nothing has okay. been done. Why is the law not being enforced? Because the quarry owners are very powerful. They are money bags. There are three or four big families who are owning these quarries in this particular region, and their net income per day is about hundred thousand rupees. Namaste, Namaste, Jyota Ji. The worker quietly tells the swami that this is one of the owners. Could, could we ask him how much profit does he take per day or per month out of these coins? Khano se aapko roz ka kitna munafa ho jata hai? Dal bol raha hai roti nahi milti sakti chhote. Mere ko sambhal do tum mujhe de do jo dete ho. जो जो आप ऑफर कर दो जो देते हो मुझे दे दो मुझे नाउ इट इज सिचुएशन इज वेरी बैड वी आर नॉट इवन एबल टू मेक मीट टू एंड्स ऑफ आवर लाइफ डू यू बिलीव दैट बिगर जो आप ना आप मुझे दे दो मंथली और संभाल लो ही इज ड्राइविंग अ फाइन मोटर कार मंथली दे दो मुझे संभाल लो ले लो एवरीथिंग टेक ऑल माय बिजनेस Just give me something to live on. I'm ready to exchange my whole business for that. Would he like to exchange his life for the way one of these men lives? आप अपनी जिंदगी को इन मजदूरों से करना चाहेंगे? तब आप ये लोग भी रोटी खा रहे हैं। जैसे आप चाहो क्या करने? If you like, then he's ready. Okay, I'd like to see that. <laughs> This is one of a dozen or more tiny squalid workers villages scattered over the vast arid surface of the quarry itself. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Moti Ram ji paida hue. What is his hope for the future life of this baby? What kind of a life does he have? Tum sare zindagi ek mazdoor rahe ho. Jaise hamare maa-baap ko karte the ye sochte hain. 
क्या माँ बाप हमारे माँ बाप सोचेंगे ना जैसे ये सोचेंगे तो हमने सोचेंगे ये सोचेंगे माय फादर थॉट अबाउट मी व्हाटेवर वेल बट आई एंडेड अप एज लेबरर एंड व्हाटेवर आई माइट थिंक अबाउट माय सन ही टू विल एंड अप एज लेबरर इन द क्वालिटी Let's go. 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 Let's
I was just particularly interested always in politics, but I very much doubt um, if I hadn't become a peer that I would have actually gone in on the hustings. I'm not sure I had the right push and dash to get in on that. I'm not a very forceful person in pushing myself. Uh, that's one of the beauties about the Lords. We're not uh, a pushy house. If the gang had been a bit heavier, I think he might have come in. Ah, a bit down, a drink. A drink. My great grandfather was a lord, and then my father was a lord, and then, in due course, I became one. It didn't actually make a penny worth of difference at all. My direct ancestor, Baron of Mowbray, in, in 1215, was one of the 25 barons who did succeed in extracting from King John a charter. We know that charter is Magna Carta, a democratic landmark, but in fact, it was an aristocratic power struggle. It was a rebellious challenge to the monarch from his rich and mighty barons. England's green and pleasant land echoed and re-echoed over the centuries with struggle and revolt. But always, the land lay quietly at the foundation of wealth and power. The landless, the tenants, the vast army of servants, the so-called ordinary folk, had virtually no voice except to assent, which they mostly did with deference. Nothing would even begin to change that land-based rule of lord and gentry until about 200 years ago. And the change did not come from the land. The water coursing over that limestone lip may have changed the political face of Britain more than all the blood that flowed through the streets in wars and rebellions. Very special water. It drains off the old Derbyshire lead mines, never freezes, and it runs through here at a constant 71 tons per minute. And in 1771, it powered the start of the second great British Revolution, when a genius named Richard Arkwright set up a couple of water wheels in it to drive a whole building full of new machines that he invented. They were called water frames. And they transformed the spinning of cotton. Cotton used to be spun by hand in cottages spread all over the countryside. But now people were coming by hundreds to work in what was the world's first successful cotton mill. And the little country villages, almost overnight, swelled into towns of thousands. Later, when steam made water obsolete as the prime source of industrial power, there was a kind of population implosion that created the great industrial cities of northern England. But neither the men and women and children who worked in the mills, nor the wealthy industrialists who owned them, had any representation in the Parliament of England. Political power was still in the hands of the landed gentry. That sounds outrageous today. But this abandoned ruin, Old Sarum, was an even worse outrage. In the 18th century, it was represented by two members of Parliament, even though nobody lived here. The Lord of the Manor leased, for the time being, some of his land to any two people he thought likely, probably two tenant farmers. They then became landowners, which made them eligible for voting, because in those days, of course, only people who owned land could vote. However, after the election, these two characters had to hand back their leases rather smartly, and nothing more was heard of them <laughs> until the next general election. When you consider that there were towns like Birmingham and Manchester with enormous populations and no representation in Parliament, and you get this rotten borough on this windswept, waterless, uninhabited mound, was sending two MPs to Parliament each general election, it shows the farcical situation we had in the 18th century. This outrage ended in 1832 when Parliament passed a reform bill. Political power based on the land was beginning to change. But the change would be slow, and it would be reluctant. ...of Oxford. Oxford and its sister university, Cambridge, had always been the training grounds of the British leadership. 
the precincts of the children of the land. But the slow, reluctant pace of British change crept in here too. And in this century, the offspring of the landed gentry found themselves alongside some children of shopkeepers and even workers who would soon be not only sharing their champagne, but tasting political power too. My Lord and members of the House of Commons. When the Queen opens Parliament, she sets out the government's plans in a speech prepared for her by the Prime Minister. This Conservative Prime Minister was a grocer's daughter, and she has declared that those old class divisions can be banished, the British disease of war between the workers and the owners cured, and British democracy given a new confidence and strength, primarily by a radical, government-directed redistribution of wealth and that the best possible democracy will flow from a revolution, a capitalist revolution. Joyce Sargent enthusiastically agrees. She's a washroom attendant in the offices of a trust company in Birmingham. Joyce Sargent is a member of the British working class. Because of the Thatcher Revolution, she has become a capitalist. Thatcher offered shares in British gas at an attractive discount. Sargent bought some. She also bought shares in the company she works for. Yes, I mean, when you have shares, you are part owner of the uh, company. And, of course, uh, I used to get a bit of flack about that. In fact, I'm, oh, well, I mean, she's one of the bosses now. You know, she's got shares. Under the Thatcher plan, the number of working-class people who own shares in British companies has grown by 550%. If you've got shares in that company, you don't want to see it go down, do you? So naturally you work hard to keep the company going because it's actually your company as well. So you're not going to go against your own company and strike or do anything that's going to harm the company in any way. So I think the more people have got shares in the company, the better it is for the company also. I'm bringing a racket to give them tomorrow. Yeah. So, that's a rally round. Rally round. Oh, you know. Yeah. Joyce Sargent lives in a row of council homes, houses traditionally built by the town government and rented to the working class. Behind the Thatcher plan is the old idea that if you have a stake in the country, you won't rock the boat. Joyce's husband, Ron, is now too ill to work. He used to be a union shop steward, and they both used to vote for the Labour Party. Now they vote for Margaret Thatcher. As people earn more, they want to own more. They value the security which comes from ownership, whether of shares or homes. Soon, there will be more shareholders than trade unionists in this country. Good. What about that? For years, we conservatives had talked about wanting to create a property-earning democracy. Indeed, extending ownership has been one of the achievements of which I am most proud. And so am I. She's proud because, with substantial government help, she bought her council house under the Thatcher plan. And she polished and fixed up her new treasure till it stands out on the block. Forty years ago when I got married, I wouldn't have dreamed that I would have had shares in a company and owned my own house. Oh, I had every intention of buying a home when I could. I was lucky that the government gave us the opportunity to buy our own home. She's become more active politically, too, out actually working for Mrs. Thatcher's capitalist conservative party. I deliver the leaflet. And you see the change in the homes when they're bought. You can actually tell which home is bought and which is not. Mind you, I'm not saying everyone that's in a council house don't look after it, because a lot of people do, but I think they take more pride in it when it is their own. Can you think I could convince you to um, come on to our side? No chance. No chance. 
so I mean, you don't change your you don't change your colours, do it? It doesn't matter what happens. I mean, I've I've always voted Labour. I've changed my colours. I used to Labour. Ever since and you bought your house. Be like, no, long before I bought the house, I was Conservative. And so was Ron. Ron's, well, you know, Ron was a shop steward. Always been Labour. But the point is this: I don't like Thatcher. I don't like what she stands for. I'm a Labour man. And you'll always be and a I hope they carry me out here as a Labour man. Can no way, never, no way would I ever vote. If they would know that, if they wasn't there another party, I would never vote for the Conservative Party. Yeah, I think it's much fairer in Britain today. There's not the great divide between the working class and the upper class as they used to be. I mean, because they can all talk to one another better now. I mean, you can talk to them the same as you're talking to anybody else. They're no different, really. Hello, Mr. But there is a great divide between people like Joyce who have a job and a house and people who have nothing. No house, no shares, no job. The price of this democracy, of this capitalist revolution, is that there are more poor people than before. These men are supplementing their welfare payments by picking over a mountain of refuse outside Liverpool. This is the kind of stuff they're looking for. Scrap wire, copper, aluminum, anything that they can pack home in a shopping cart and sell for a few pence or 10p, half a pound. And there are people up here on this garbage dump every day making a living. Ivor Anderson is one of them, 62 years old, a former salvage diver. He's now a self-employed salvage picker. The lads are getting a bit of wire here, a bit of wire there, a bit of copper here, a bit of copper there. I go over there for paint, anything for the house carpet. Can you make a living off it? I can. Can some? Oh, a few can. On scrap. I don't go with scrap. Why do they bother? Why don't they just sit around and collect their welfare checks? Can you live on thirty pound a week? I know you couldn't. Try and live on thirty two pound a week. I'm supposed to keep yourself on thirty two pounds. Me. The dark side of Margaret Thatcher's faith in the magic power of owning property is that it has nothing to say to that 20% of Britons who are poor and getting poorer. It's been reported that in this street of council homes not far from Liverpool, not one single person has a job. And after nearly a decade of the new capitalism, while there may be a million Joyce Sargents who have bought their council homes, there are also tens of thousands of Britons who are homeless. And there are more of them all the time, people who cannot have any stake in the future of this country. And until they do, I think that the health of the democracy itself is in trouble. Eight hundred miles east of Liverpool, they also base their claim to be a democracy on ideas about wealth and property. Only here the faith is Marxist, not capitalist. You may not be free to come and go, but the East Germans call it a democracy because there are no acknowledged class distinctions and everyone has a job. Here, the state calls the tune in everything, including culture. The rebuilt opera house shows what a beautiful city East Germany's Dresden must have been before that night in 1945, when more than a thousand Allied bombers came over from England, set off Europe's worst firestorm, and vaporized most of the city and over a hundred thousand of its people. Herr Irma was only five the year the city was destroyed. Sometimes he and his wife and son walk among and muse upon what the forces of democracy accomplished on that night. 
der Mittag, der Nachmittag und der Abend. When the communists took over, they rebuilt and preserved some of the antique elegance of Dresden. They also rebuilt East German society according to a Marxist order where no one expects to be very rich or very poor. The Irmas left that for a year to try out the capitalist order of West Germany. But a lifetime in a total welfare state had not prepared them. They were surprised at how tough it is in a world of opportunity and risk. And so they came back, bringing with them home appliances and memories of a life they couldn't cope with. So then we are also mit großen Hoffnungen ausgerüstet zu diesem Arbeitsamt nach Kassel. Und der erste Eindruck war zunächst also erstmal der, wir mussten also dort eine Vielzahl von jungen Leuten vorfinden, auf den Gängen dieses Arbeitsamtes, was ja in unserem bisherigen Leben undenkbar war. Und nach Befragung dieser Leute mussten wir also feststellen, dass diese jungen Leute alle eine Arbeit suchten. Und das war natürlich erstmals ein schockierender Eindruck. Hier in der DDR, es kann also jeder seinem Nachbarn seine Sorgen und Nöte übertragen. Dieser nimmt daran teil und versucht auch nach seinen Möglichkeiten da Hilfestellung zu leisten. Und äh, dort also in Westdeutschland mussten wir also feststellen, dass die Leute doch wohl auch äh, ein Herz dafür hatten, aber äh, aus gegebenen Gründen, äh, dass sie ihre Stellung nicht verlieren oder so, äh, davon Abstand genommen haben, obwohl sie es gewollt hätten. Dass jeder nur auf seinen eigenen Vorteil bedacht ist. Und das ist ein Zustand, also der ist in der DDR einfach undenkbar. Demokratie sollte doch nicht äh, das zu machen, was, was jeder will, sondern das, das was wir für die Mehrzahl gut ist. Ist schwimmfähig. Stehende kleine Hindernisse können eine Zeitdauer von 30 Minuten überwunden werden. The Irmas have opted for a system that puts its faith not in the individual, but in the state. Some might say that they're enslaved to that state. They would resent that. Unlike most people in this park, they had the opportunity to choose, and they chose a life with no financial surprises. We can! Young soldiers of the state are singing plaintively about a different system. The Irmas listen serenely. They have tried Western democracy and decided that the price is just too high. The price of democracy for this island nation has also been very high. Jamaica, for 300 years, was a British colony founded on slavery. At the resorts, they do a traditional dance that celebrates the end of slavery. They do the dance for the tourists. Tourists bring in millions of dollars every year to Duns River Falls and the other enchanted parts of the island. Tourists seldom see behind the facade of elegance and cheerfulness. It looks lush, but it's a nation with few resources. 
And in the 1970s, everything began to go wrong. The market dried up for its principal export, bauxite. Social unrest made the tourists abandon the resorts. As rust and rot set in, Jamaica's democratic independence would also begin to decay. Patsy Baker works part-time in a private school. She has had five children by five different fathers. To support the four surviving kids and her mother, she has, for a week, the equivalent of what an average U.S. worker makes in about one hour. I get paid Friday. By Sunday, I can't find bus to go back to work Monday. Sometimes you borrow, or you might go to the shop and ask them to credit you something, and to pay back the debt, you don't have nothing leave again for me $60. There's a part of Kingston that prudent tourists stay away from. Patsy lives there, in a two-room shack patched up with plastic bags and cardboard. Her drinking water and electricity were cut off for non-payment. She got them reconnected illegally, and when she compares her place to Duns River Falls, it's not because of the landscape. This is the last rain that fall. It just tear off the whole complex of the toilet. So when rain fall, in the air flood. Can't stay in the house. It's like Guns River Falls in there, right? You can't bed in there, do everything in there. You have to walk with Alhambra in the house. I just run in bed wet, everything wet. How can't afford to buy a thing to put up on it? So what to do is put the plastic on top of the old stuff to go down to the factory, bake some cardboard and sort of seal the inside. So we just cope with the condition for the time. <laughs> Politicians and economists may disagree about the causes of Jamaica's squalor. But Patsy Baker says that she knows exactly who to blame. I think because of the IMF and the terms that they are bringing down, and we can't cope. Just can't cope with the IMF. The IMF is the International Monetary Fund. This is its headquarters in Washington, D.C. The bank of last resort for countries in distress, not for development aid, but to give those countries financial credibility. And in return, the borrower has to accept certain financial disciplines that the fund imposes. And these could include devaluation of currency or the reduction of spending on social programs or the promotion of private enterprise rather than public enterprise whether the borrower is a third world country, like Jamaica, or a developed country, like Britain. As far as developing countries are concerned, the International Monetary Fund has been too narrow-minded. It hasn't understood the actual problems of developing people and their economies, and believes that you can lay down dogma, and if only they follow it, everything will be all right. They do not take into account the political considerations of any government which is trying to organize the economy in order to improve the standard of living and to maintain a democracy at the same time. Through its offices here in the Bank of Jamaica building, the IMF has made several massive loans to Jamaica over the last decade. These loans were supposed to save the country from disaster. They didn't achieve that, but they did have an effect on the politics of Jamaica. The IMF has been an election issue here since 1976. This man, nicknamed Joshua, Prime Minister Michael Manley, campaigned that year on his record of social democratic programs, pensions, poor relief, free education, food subsidies. The money to pay for them came from a special tax on bauxite. But some of the ideas came from Cuba, which Manley openly praised. The American bauxite owners hated Cuba and the taxes. They cut production. Never mind, Manley said, we'll go it alone. He swore he would never go to the IMN. He blamed the Americans for all Jamaica's financial troubles. 
But this politician, Edward Siaga, blamed Manley himself and his socialist cronies. But they behave like communists, they associate with communists, they work like communists, they think like communists, and they do the things that communists do. And as far as we are concerned, we know that they are a communist government hiding behind the fact of some other pretty name until the time comes if they get the chance when they will reveal what they really are. Liars! Liars and propagandists. They just pick out the one thing about Cuba. It's all about Michael is Fidel friend, true? I'm Fidel's friend, is true? Because we're both fighting for poor people to get justice in the world. He won that election, but soon he was forced to break his promise to the people and go to the IMF for help. As a condition, the fund insisted that Manley abandon social programs the people had voted for. What the IMF does is to impose an ideology. It imposes a theory of economic management and organization, which is, you know, very free market in its orientation. And fair enough, if that's what your country is into, if that's what you're trying to do, no quarrel. But there are many ways to develop an economy. In our own concept, for instance, we had believed very strongly in mixed economy where the state plays a role and the private sector plays a role and you try to get the two to pull in harness together. And what they did was to put enormous pressure on us in working out the terms of an agreement to dismantle state participation in the economy, which really is an external imposition of an ideological point of view, which may not really be what a country thinks it can do. During Manley's second term, Jamaica found it impossible to meet the IMF's performance demands. The markets were shrinking. The economy was sinking lower and lower. The poor were hit worst, but it was not just the poor. People saw increasing difficulty, not only in food prices in the supermarket, but in the cost of social services such as health and education, in getting children to school, and so on. And these were the, the, the problems which they faced. For some middle class families, it was a question of whether they should literally reschedule the payment of the electricity bill this month or do without the telephone the next month. The social effect, of course, is disastrous because in small poor countries that are struggling to establish the beginnings of social welfare of educational systems and things of that sort. The minute you put a heavy squeeze on budget expenditure, you eliminate not luxuries, but almost the preconditions of social viability. And so from that point of view, you know, to, to cut the budget means that you start, uh, you're forced to cut back in health, in education, etc., which means you're stripping from the bone into the marrow, not taking flesh off a bone. One official of the fund told me that their role is to be like the firemen who are called in to put out the fire. And he said, if some damage is caused, don't blame the firemen. They didn't set the fire. The trouble is, this time it was gunfire. In 1980, 800 Jamaicans died in a horrific, bloody election campaign fought over Manley's vision of a socialist future without the IMF and Siaga's vision of a capitalist future with the fund. We were actually pinned down in a particular area for two and a half hours this morning. Siaga, the free enterpriser, won. Perhaps that pleased the IMF. But the economy still did not improve. And finally, Siaga, too, was in trouble with the IMF. One looks at a situation before the fund comes into the picture and after the fund comes into the picture. And if the situation after the fund comes in is worse, it's easy enough to say the fund did it. The real issue, and this is the issue that politicians are addressing when they invite the fund in, is what would be the condition without the fund. And it is this failure of people to recognize that without the fund, the situation could have been worse. 
graffiti on the street say I'm heavy for two, I'm a burden. The graffiti on the street say I'm heavy for true, I'm a burden. I will raise my hand and the seas will part. My people will walk to the promised land. But they won't walk very far. They will drive motor car. Ten dollars a gallon. Food in the stores, but tomorrow we'll borrow some more. Like Tiaga, foreign food galore, for tomorrow we'll borrow some more. From Arabia, Arab is the best, so I let go IMF. Arab it's comforting the best, for the so people to have the IMF as a scapegoat, and it's nice for the government to have someone to blame for its failures. But it's not the IMF, it's poverty itself, which will always be a threat to the democratic independence of any nation. And tomorrow, we'll borrow some more. I began this inquiry into the price of democracy by discovering that a kind of slavery still exists in what we call a free world. The origins of democracy are tainted with slavery in the two most famous startups, Athens and America. But there is no more need in the world for human slaves. With workers like these, precise, tireless, producing more wealth than humans ever could, creating more jobs than they replace. And so what about the question, do you have to be wealthy to be a democracy? Well, history suggests that it sure helps, that people who own something have a stake in it, people who have the resources and the leisure to get an education and a view of the future that it could be a little bit better than the past, begin to want to have some control over how their world is governed. But what about those who are left out of the wealth that these things produce, have no stake in it? Is it possible that future historians are going to look back at our democratic experiment and say that we had an underclass that was the equivalent of the slaves of ancient Athens and the beginnings of America?